My name is Mamta. Um, it's the question of uh, the, the universe, the appearance of the universe. Um, in the dream state, each one, each mind has its, uh, you know, uh, there is an appearance of a universe. So we're talking about multiple universes there. Yeah. Um, in the waking state, you say that the appearance is the, uh, uni- there's one appearance and that is uh, coming out of the consciousness. Yes. But there are many minds. So is that that one appearance that all minds are um, like uh, experiencing? Right. Clearly that there is a common universe of experience because we all experience a common room which we are sharing, which we, are, we experience this. There's a public experience. But at the same time, we have a private experience also. Each of us has a first-person experience. This very thing we are, each of us is experiencing from a different point of view and it is colored by our thoughts and perceptions. So there is a distinctness for each individual being also. But Gaurapada's point is different. Even in the dream, we say that the universe is projected by the mind and that, that everybody accepts. We accept. Each mind, according to its conditioning, projects a dream universe. But Gaurapada says, even in the dream, that mind itself appears in consciousness and then projects its own universe. And in the waking also, various minds appearing in consciousness, uh, they experience a commonly projected universe in slightly different ways. The best way to understand it is always to look at your own experience, how you are experiencing the world. Advaita, the beauty of Advaita is, the more closely you understand it, Though its claims seem to be remarkable and radical, the more closely you study it and follow it, you just begin to see it's just reporting a fact. This is the way it is. Yes. But you must learn to see it, what is called phenomenologically. That means from the point of view of your own experience. Yeah. As we experience it. Hmm. I saw that the which yes. is actually the main thing behind it. So, when, when we are saying that the ignorance is removed, the ignorance is removed from, from the one person, because we have m- many minds, right? Yes, yes. So, the ignorance has to be removed multiple times in multiple minds. Yes. So, uh, th- th- then that's leading to the other one is about the experience itself, especially about suffering. Hmm. So... You know, I feel like in my mind, this this mind, I've got a ticket. I know I can get out of it. Yes. But somebody close to me, I yes. can see them. They're suffering and right. they can't, I can't explain to them this whole thing. Right. So w- what about them? Like, do we have right. to worry about them? Right. This knowledge removes suffering, but it only removes suffering from the person who has that knowledge. So it's from your particularly from your point of view. The others, there's a whole philosophical point of where the, whether there are others or not. So for example, in your dream, in your dream, clearly, though you see others, they are not others. They are all one with you, the dreamer. Now, in this waking world, the approach is, you can approach it in both ways. One way is that you accept that there are all others. This approach is called Srishti Drishti Vada. I will not explain in detail. But there is another approach in which you take Drishti Srishti Vada, in which it, it is equated to a dream in which there are no others. You are the only one who exists. It's a very solipsistic uh, approach to Advaita. But the practical answer to your question is this. For others, uh, always have the, have the sense of oneness and sympathy. And try your best to remove the suffering of others. Why? You say this, it's a truism, uh, and anybody, any good person would try to remove the sufferings of others. But explain from the point of view of Advaita why you would try to remove the sufferings of others. The answer is very simple. All this Advaita that we are doing, the first practical answer, then I'll give you the philosophical answer. This Advaita that we are doing, all of this, is it not to remove my own suffering? I am practicing all of this to remove my own suffering. I do everything to remove my own suffering. If I have hunger, I go and eat. If I am if sick, I go and take medicine. And if I, if I understand in depth 
that my real problem is ignorance, then I try to remove ignorance by spiritual illumination, by enlightenment. So all the time I'm trying to remove my, my suffering from a physical level, subtle level, and at the causal level also. If that is so, Advaita tells you, you alone are everybody else. Then the effort to remove my suffering and the effort to remove other person's suffering should be at the equal level. A truly spiritual person will identify with everybody and will work to remove their suffering. Now you say you cannot enlighten others. You can, if you have that power, then you would give spiritual knowledge. That's a service to remove the suffering of others. But if you cannot, then help in other ways. Uh, Swami Vivekananda said, suffering can be removed by, by service. Service can be at the level of you know, relief from hunger, from disease, from secular ignorance, by giving secular education. All of that is based on an Advaitic approach. That if I myself am suffering in these ways from disease, from hunger, from cold, from, uh, from um, uh, uh, being illiterate, from being oppressed. So all of these ways I can, I can help others and I should. So the two, two answers here, practical answer is, because I work to remove my own suffering and yet Advaita tells me I alone am all of that then I should work to remove other people's suffering also. If I tr work to remove this body-mind suffering and ignore others, there's a deep ignorance working in, in that. And that philosophical answer is, the basis for this approach is, the oneness of all existence. Advaita says, you alone are all of this. If all of this is one, then efforts for removing suffering should, should encompass everybody also. Yes. Prayer also for them. Like Definitely. As as so what do you do for them? You can pray for them. And whatever physical, mental, emotional need you can satisfy for others as a service, you should do it. One should certainly do it. <coughs> Swami Akhandananda, who started an orphanage. He was a great Vedantin. After Sri Ramakrishna passed away, he traveled to Tibet and in the Himalayas. Very beautiful books he has written. And at one time, I think, yes, he had decided that uh, he would forever go away to the Himalayas and spend the rest of his life there in meditation and spiritual practice. He was traveling through Bharampur, one of the poorest areas. Even now it's one of the poorest areas of Bengal, West Bengal. And at that time it was in the grip of famine. People were starving. And he couldn't bear the sufferings of those people. And he said, I can't do anything for them. Let me go away from here. What can I do? And he saw this little girl, very skinny, emaciated, a Muslim girl. She was sitting and weeping helplessly. And he asked her, what's wrong? And she said that they, the poor family, they owned only one pot. Oh, the pot again, the Vedantic pot. <laughs> they owned only one pot. And she had come, fed, come to fetch water with that pot. And it fell and it broke. And now she was afraid that her mother would scold her and beat her. And she was crying. She obviously had not had food to eat. And she was so helpless. Now there, Akhandananda did not tell her that the, it, was, it was clay all along. <laughs> and it, <laughs> he took her to the shop and he had a few paisa, few, few cents with him, which he spent to buy her a pot for her. Immediately he was surrounded by a group of hungry children all clamoring for food, tugging at his robes. And he stayed there that night. And he prayed to Sri Ramakrishna, that what can I do for them? And Sri Ramakrishna said, you stay here and wait and see, it will all happen in its time. It's a wonderful work of service which started at that time. The first orphanage of the Ramakrishna order and uh, the work of service which is still going on. Even now, people in that locality, they call it Baba's ashram. Baba is the old father, that means Akhandananda's ashram. He stayed there for the rest of his life. This great Vedantin who wanted to go to the Himalayas and meditate and spend the rest of his life there, he stayed here. Did he give up the Vedantic point of view? Not at all. This was a flowering of the Vedantic point of view. One great Vedanta scholar, uh, Pramada Das Babu from Kashi, he wrote a letter to Akhandananda, slightly critical about him. He said, you are monks. You wander the land and you beg for your food and, and you teach spirituality. You, know, you give talks on Mandukya. <laughs> Why start all these schools and uh, these are meant for people in, in the society. These are not, it's not your work, Swami. 
Akhandananda wrote back a fiery letter. He said, that one existence, which, which we talk about in Vedanta, I see that in the poor and the hungry, in the tears of the helpless. If, I, if this life is spent in service to them, to Brahman in all of these forms, and for that I have to go to hell, I am ready to go to hell many times over, to serve my Lord in all of these forms. Now, this is real Vedanta, this is the real flowering of Vedanta. It follows directly from the teachings of uh, Gaurapada also. Thank you. One good way of answering these questions is always look at the lives of enlightened people. Those whom you consider enlightened people, what did they do? Questions? Don't be afraid. Come. Anybody? Mm. Nobody? <laughs> Bill? You don't have to come. You ask a question from there. I'll repeat it. Yes. Uh, you say that uh, the uh, pot is merely a, is a, a clay. Yes. But uh, the pot is really clay plus energy to make the pot. Yes. All right, here's a question from a physics point of view. So the example of the pot, Bill asked this question, I'll repeat it for the camera, that in the analogy of the pot, it seems that you've ignored the role that energy plays in making the pot. Clay is shaped into pot, you put some energy into it, in, into making that, and you're ignoring that. Then you say that the pot is nothing but clay, but the pot is clay plus the energy that has been put into making it into a pot. And that brings into the whole question of entropy also. Order and chaos and entropy. Well, the straight answer to that is, uh, it's an example. Uh, an example is meant to prove one point. It's not meant to cover everything. Uh, it's, meant, it's meant, so if you'll ask then, what is the point that is meant, it's meant to prove? It's meant to prove that, substantially speaking, what you regard as the pot, it is nothing other than that uh, that clay, the substance behind it. Yes, if to actually make a pot out of clay, you have you need a potter and you need a potter's wheel and it, it has to go round and round and the potter has to put in ingenuity and energy, of course. Not only pot, not only clay, but also it requires water and then later you need fire to bake it and make it into a, 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 a pot. So all of that is there. That's not what we are talking about. But suppose you were to talk about all of that. The point would still remain, all of that which went into making it a pot, the pot is nothing apart from that. Even if you, even if, commonsensically if you look at it, if somebody says, it's not a pot, it's clay plus energy. That's not how we normally look at it. We look at it as a pot. Yeah. It, the, the point would still stand. Yes. That book I would really highly recommend. Um, Why Does the World Exist? Jim Holt. Yes, come. My name is Abhijit. Yes. Uh, so, while we were discussing in this lecture that Gaurapada cuts down all the different philosophies and he speaks about the, he claims the falsity of universe. He strongly claims that. The non-origination of the universe. Yes, that's what he means by falsity. Yes. So, these are the highest truths. Yes. And when we read about them, like, it makes sense. But still, I think for a, for a person or like for us to understand it, we have to be at a certain uh, level to understand it. Or it would be just like a textbook knowledge. You just read it and that's it. Hmm. So, then, like, 
then that means we have to increase our uh, understanding of it and then i think four yogas help us that way so by just using uh, knowledge philosophical knowledge it seems insufficient alone hmm. because even though i have in, even let's say i inquire hard enough still to be able to that stage so that i can grasp it yes there is something else needed right which pure philosophy or pure gyan might hmm. not be sufficient for so right what is that other thing which is needed is knowledge sufficient or does knowledge require any supplement what are the vitamins required for knowledge to be effective advaita says knowledge is sufficient but what kind of knowledge it means that living knowledge that absolute realization i am existence consciousness bliss where i can honestly say it to myself not just chant a verse or tell others or even explain it i can honestly say yes that's how i feel that's how, that's that's how what the reality is i should have the same confidence that shankara or vivekananda or sri ramakrishna had or ramana maharshi had that to that point knowledge must be there but that knowledge um seems to be a little different from what he's asking abhijit is that that w- knowledge that realization seems to be somewhat different from what we are getting here what we are getting here is information arguments a little bit of sanskrit and <laughs> Uh, and a kind of guidance and a pointer and we intellectually begin to grasp at what is being said that is true practically speaking philosophically speaking knowledge is sufficient philosophically speaking as a matter of principle knowledge is sufficient that must be said otherwise uh, i would be doing it an injustice gyana teva kaivalyam from knowledge alone comes release um, even the bible says truth will know the truth and the truth shall set you free so know the truth but what kind of knowledge that kind of knowledge to attain knowledge what they mean by knowledge in the upanishads one requires supplements the supplements not that no, be careful not that knowledge requires supplements we require the supplements our minds require strengthening Sri Ramakrishna when this kind of vedanta was being discussed in the gospel of Ramakrishna Sri Ramakrishna listens to the discussion and he comments at the end of the discussion these this talk is good but it needs to be assimilated in bengali he says katha gulo bhalo dharona hawa chai the words are good but needs to be assimilated now how do you assimilate it how do you make it a living truth the question is then what prevents you from making it a living truth what are the obstacles the knowledge itself is fine but the obstacles are in us not in the knowledge now what are the problems in us problems are threefold according to vedanta one problem is ignorance itself agyana the second problem is the scatteredness of the mind vikshepa and the third problem is the impurity of the mind mala chitta mala so three things mala vikshepa agyana i'm talking about classical vedanta here mala vikshepa jnana each of these problems ignorance distraction and impurity has its own solution solution for ignorance always any ignorance solution is knowledge how does knowledge come according to vedanta through jnana yoga listening reflecting meditating shravana manana nididhyasana you say but we have been doing that 10 years 20 years 30 years i've been coming to so many classes and i've got so many notes mm-hmm. volumes of notes and tapes and so on and so forth and recordings my hard disk is full <laughs> well, the hard disk might be enlightened but you are not enlightened yet <laughs> <laughs> then what is the problem the problem is the next level the mind is not assimilating these truths we hear it we even understand it at a superficial level we can even explain it to others but it's not living to me my life in the world continues as it was with the same problems and anxieties and you know plus one extra anxiety i'm not enlightened yet <laughs> <laughs> that's an extra anxiety added on vedantic anxiety is added to worldly anxiety and then it continues so the mind is unable to absorb it because of the distraction we are a very distracted lot 
we really don't know how distracted we are until we try to concentrate. So, distraction, solution, problem distraction, solution, concentration. Concentration, solution, what is the method? The method is meditation. So, a variety, a wide range of meditation techniques, methodologies are available in yoga. Vedanta, for example, calls upon the resources of yoga. If you ask Gaudapada, oh, so I need to meditate, please teach me how to meditate, he'll give you one or two verses. He's not interested. He said he'll give you a referral, meditation specialist. <laughs> you go there. And the specialist also will have co-payment. So, there. <laughs> so that guy will teach you meditation, how to focus the mind. And start focusing the mind. I have taken mantra diksha or I have got initiated in this way or that way, in one technique or one tradition or the other. I sit for meditation and if I'm honest, one of the two things happens. First, at first it goes well, for a few days or weeks. Then two, one of the two things happens. Either I get deadly bored of it and I get distracted or I feel sleepy and fall asleep every time I try to meditate. Why is this happening? I was supposed to get focused. It's not happening. The answer is at the d even deeper level of the mind. Chitta mala, the third level of impurity, the impurity of the mind. A lot of vasanas, past conditionings and impressions have been stuffed into the mind. The mind is upset. The mind is not itself. So much of garbage we have unloaded into the mind, unthinkingly. See, if you go to the dumpster there, nobody is going to think of, unless it's an insane person, nobody is going to think of putting your hands in the dumpster and taking out something and putting it in your mouth. Even the thought of it makes you feel sick. If you do that, your stomach is going to be upset immediately. But we are reaching into the dumpster of the world and pulling out things and putting it into our minds indiscriminately. How? Through the eyes, through the ears. Whatever somebody says, we take in, especially if it is about me. Something good about me, yeah, I want to listen. Something bad about me, even then I, I want to listen. I'm, I'm even more in, interested in listening. about. And about so many things in the world, continuously disturbing the mind by seeing and hearing. Uh, we, are, we are indiscriminate. We discriminate about what we eat, but we indiscriminate about what we eat with our eyes and ears. Ahara is not only with the mouth, ahara is with the senses also. And there is so much conditioning from past, which is there. Greed, lust, anger, pride, envy, huh? prejudices, negativities, crowd the mind. That mind, if you try to meditate, won't work. So that mind has to be cleaned up. Impurity of the mind and solution in Sanskrit, it is called chitta shuddhi. You say, ah, what's this great solution? It means nothing more than purity of the mind. <laughs> and how is the purity of the mind accomplished? By uh, karma yoga. Unselfish action is a very powerful uh, method for cleansing the mind um, based on, uh, on a, a, a mor strictly moral, disciplined life. Basically, the message is clean up your life. Then only you can clean up the mind. With a clean mind and a clean, clear conscience, then when you try to meditate, with a pure mind you try to meditate, the mind gets focused very fast. One Swami said, the pure mind runs to God by itself. It doesn't have to be cajoled and pushed towards God. Sri Ramakrishna says, if you love God and you want God, you will get God realization. But you know, we sort of scratch our heads and think, yeah, that's the whole point. How do you love God and want God? I really don't want, I know I should want God or love God, but I don't really love God or want God. How do you do that? that we don't do that because the mind is impure. Sri Ramakrishna says, it's like a needle, and the needle is covered by mud. The magnet attracts the needle, needle by its own nature. The magnet attracts the needle by its own nature. The needle's nature is such it will be attracted by the ma magnet. But because it's covered by mud, it does not. The mud has to be cleansed, and then the needle immediately is pulled by the magnet. Meditation becomes easy, fast, natural. With the pure and meditative mind, when you reflect upon Vedanta, that's the idea that that flash of illumination, that breakthrough, it comes. It comes. Always, here I'll add one thing. So all of the yogas, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, raja yoga, jnana yoga, all are necessary. 
Jnana Yoga gives that knowledge which will set, set us free. But it has to be supplemented by all the yogas. And Advaita does not deny the necessity of all the yogas. Shankaracharya in the Bhagavad Gita, he again and again emphasizes, you must do work. You must do work in an unselfish manner, in, as a worship of God. You must meditate, you must worship. But ultimately it is this philosophical insight. Says, really, does anybody say philosophy will enlighten you? Swami Vivekananda clearly says, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within. Do it by, the first thing he says, by philosophy. That is Jnana Yoga. By psychic control, that is Dhyana, meditation. By love, that is Bhakti Yoga. Or work, that is Karma Yoga. By one or more or all of these and be free, that is the whole of religion. Books, temples, doctrines, churches are secondary details. Best definition of religion I have heard. Comprehensive, precise and to the point. So all the yogas are useful. If we do not do all those other things and only listen to Vedanta talks and read books, we will come to the feeling that I have learned something very clever, very intelligent, very, very nice. And yes, I am the original Buddha. I am. The, it's, but still I am miserable and weeping all the time. What is the use, use of a weeping Buddha? Not a very attractive picture. So the original Buddha should be peaceful and serene and happy. And that's what pulls other people that, yes, this person has found something which will be of use. You know, I have met very uh, Swamis who were enlightened. And one feeling I would always get is, I want what you have. Yeah. It's incredibly attractive, this thing, that th such a thing is possible. Not only are you uplifted, but everybody else around you is automatically, just by your own presence. Such a thing is possible. But it requires all the other practices too. Thank you. Very good question. Often the way I teach, many people have this question. That um, yes, we begin to get what you are talking about. But it doesn't seem to make a difference in our lives. It seems awfully difficult. It seems difficult because the the... Preliminary practices have not been strengthened. The preliminary practices must go on. But one thing I will stress. Remember, it all boils down to this one breakthrough. You must make the breakthrough and realize that you are this self, this pure consciousness. Even if the, I'll go so far as to say, even if the other preparations are not complete, the breakthrough can still be made. All that you have to do is afterwards you have to complete those preparations again. How does it work? All the other yogas prepare the mind for this breakthrough, for this enlightenment. If the mind is ready, the enlightenment comes. And it's done. Nothing really more needs to be done. But if the mind is not ready, an enlightenment still comes. It's possible. Enlightenment still comes. Then what you need to do is to get the full benefit of that enlightenment. Those same preparations have to be gone through. There, this, has, this has been very nicely analyzed in a text called Jivan Mukti Viveka. The analysis of freedom while living. There, Vidyaranya, the one who wrote Panchadashi, he writes, three things are involved in this Jivan Mukti, the highest ideal of Vedanta, being free while living in this body. Three, three components are there. First is enlightenment. He calls it Tattva Bodha, realization of reality. Tattva Bodha. What is that realization of reality? I am Brahman. I am that Turiyam. I am that Adi Buddha. Adi Shantaha. That is realization of reality. That's first. This must be supported by what he calls Manonasha. Literally it means destruction of the mind. What I spoke about, no mind earlier. Destruction of the mind does not mean you become brain dead. Become a zombie. No. It means the mind will be there. It's fully working. But you realize you are not the mind. It's an instrument. It's an app. An app. <laughs> so the mind uh, is something that you use, but it's not you. Manonasha. How is that accomplished? Through meditation. And the third component is called... Um, uh, it, 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 third component is called... Vasanakshaya. That means, it simply means, literally means decay of 
desire. Basically, purity of mind. So that's what I just mentioned. Three things. Ignorance removed by enlightenment. Distraction removed by concentration. Impurity removed by purity. Yeah. There's a question there. Please come. Please keep track of the food situation. Please repeat the food situation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the last sentence is that um, yeah, remove the ignorance by knowledge, by enlightenment. Remove um, the distraction by concentration, and remove the impurity by purity of mind. These are the three components of Jivan Mukti. Uh, before you ask the question, one more point. Somebody may ask, suppose you just said that it is possible to be enlightened and yet other things may not be complete. What will happen to such a person? Vidyarinya discusses this. He says, you may actually get it that you are Brahman. Seriously, in a very deep sense. But if, if the other preparations are not complete, you will not be easily able to manifest that knowledge in your life. Day-to-day -day living, what you know to be real, what you have already felt to be real, it will be a struggle to manifest that in day-to-day -day life. It's because the mind is rebelling against that. If the mind is purified and under control, it will immediately manifest your realization. Yeah. Please tell us your name and ask the question. Namaste Swamiji. My name is Pallavi. Hmm. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so basically, I feel above all, grace is the grace is what plays a major role. But this seems a little bit mystery to me because why is it some people, like if everything is Brahman, why is it like some people are more attracted that that itself uh, that itself shows that they have a lot of grace, right? So when I, for example, when I try to help my friends, maybe who are struggling, like you know, by giving whatever. Uh, knowledge I have or experience, they they show no interest. Hundred times I repeat, thousand times I keep repeating, oh like God. no interest. <laughs> so I really want to like yes. do whatever I can. Right. Like my immediate family member, my brother is like no. I don't All right, he's going to be listening on this. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I am like, what is that? Uh, what is that mystery? Yes. That makes one attracted and others not. What is the role of grace, first of all? Yeah. Why some are attracted, why others are not? Yeah. Krishna asks, um, Arjuna has these questions, you know. If it is so easy, then why aren't more people um, mm. in this path? Why aren't more people realizing it? Mm. Now, um, the first of all about grace. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, the wind of grace is always blowing. God's grace is always there. The Guru's grace is always there. Then how do we take advantage of it? He gives the example of, you know, he used to live near the bank of the river Ganga. And there would be boats sailing up and down the river. Even now there are. So he said, the wind of grace is ever blowing. Raise your sail. The sail which will catch the wind. What is the sail? Make some effort. Don't say that I cannot make any effort. Because you do make efforts for everything. Imagine how much you work for um, uh, money, for family, for entertainment. How much we work, how much effort we make uncomplainingly for years and years of our life. So why can't you make a little effort for enlightenment? You can make an effort. The more effort you make, that's the raising the sail. The more grace will come and, and catch your sail and push your boat along faster. Now, why are not people more interested? And if you tell them, why are they not interested? It just requires a certain level of evolution. You cannot force people into it. It's difficult enough to force oneself along this path. It take, uh, Sri Ramakrishna is to put it very simply. Shomoy na hole haina. Unless the time is ripe, it will not work. Does that mean you have to stop saying these things? Say it, but don't become a bore. If you say a hundred times, a thousand times, you're going to, instead of helping people, you might, people might be repelled by it. Be intelligent about it. If somebody is interested, share it. If somebody is not interested, wish them well, 
and always the best thing is to help people along their own track and try to give them an upward push. That's all you can do. You can pray for them and you can help them in whatever way they are going, if you can help. So that's what you can do. As time comes, we evolve. Going deeper, why is it that so few people seek enlightenment? You know, Aurobindo, Rishi Aurobindo, his answer is very interesting. He says, everybody is seeking enlightenment. There is no exception at all. What do you mean? Are all those people out in Manhattan, millions of people, are they seeking enlightenment? They are seeking it in their own way. We are all seeking it in our own way. We are seeking happiness. We are trying to overcome misery. And the problem is, we are somehow convinced it lies outside us. The one thing that Gaurapada again and again wants to show is that what you are seeking lies within you. Within you means in your own experience. What lies within you? In the subtler than the body is the mind. Subtler than the mind is consciousness, you yourself. It lies there. But we don't focus inwards. Our minds and senses are turned outwards and we are convinced it lies somewhere out there. Though nobody till today has reported that I have got perfect satisfaction from money or relationships or, or name and fame. Nobody. Nobody reports that. Some pleasure is there. But nothing permanent and lasting. And yet we pursue it. People ask, no, but this is all that there exists. Is it possible at all to get permanent happiness, completely overcome suffering? Is it at all po possible or is it a pipe dream? It is possible. So many enlightened people have reported this. What suffering does Sri Ramakrishna report? What suffering does Vivekananda or Holy Mother or Masharada uh, or, or Ramana Maharshi or others? What suffering do they report? No. They have transcended suffering. They, one sign of being enlightened is you don't come grump, complain or grumble anymore. So, people are seeking the same thing which a spiritual seeker is seeking. But, they are seeking it in an unwise way. They are seeking it in the wrong place. In the most evident. It's not their fault. It's most evident. It's right there outside. A young person sees the world in front of him or her. Graduating from college. Here is the world. Career and relationships and name and fame and achievement and travel and entertainment and enjoyment. Grab it with both hands. And Sri Ramakrishna says, yes, go ahead. Grab it with both hands. But be intelligent about it. Ask your mind, what did I gain from this? And don't keep repeating the same thing. One must go ahead. I saw this. Sri Ramakrishna was, he once wanted an expensive shawl. And he asked, uh, that was like the height of luxury at that time. So Mathur Babu who provided him with these things, he, he got an expensive shawl, which was very expensive in those days, from Banaras. And gave it to Sri Ramakrishna. And Sri Ramakrishna put it on and walked around happily. And he told his mind, see this is the intelligence part of it. He told his mind, oh mind, look, this is what people call an expensive shawl. And they put it on and become proud and forget God. The moment he said this, he couldn't bear it anymore. He took out the shawl and threw it on the ground. And he was not satisfied with that. He spat upon it. And then, and then he jumped on it. And then he was about to set fire to it when Mathur Bhav came and rescued the <laughs> poor shawl. Now that is the intelligence part of it. That one must go ahead, don't stop there. That is why people don't. <coughs> Always try to help others, spiritually, if not spiritually, if possible, in, in any other way, emotionally, materially, whatever, and try to give them an upward push. Person is too lazy and, and uh, just taking life easy. Seems to be happy, that's not happiness, that's tamas. Then give it an upward push. What would be an upward push for a tamasic person, a lazy person, inert person? Ambition. Energy. Be up and doing. I mentioned Swami Akhandananda. He was extremely active. It was very difficult to stay with him. Ordinary people would find it impossible to stay with him. He was like a volcano of uh, uh, energy and dynamism. And he couldn't bear uh, laziness and uh, slovenliness. There was this novice, a brahmachari, who as it is the custom in, in India, in the afternoon, hot afternoons, we all take a siesta in India. So he was na nicely enjoying a nap. And Akhananda um, chanced upon him and said, what is this? 
You've become a monk and you're sleeping in the daytime. Shame upon you. Do something. Even if you cannot do spiritual practice, he says, go and read geography or something like that. He uses geography. <laughs> go, go, go read <laughs> geography. Doesn't mean geography. Anything. If, if well, one is lazy, activate. Become artistic. Become intellectual. Take up a hobby. Culture. Develop. That leads to sattva. Uh, a refinement of the mind. From refinement of the mind comes spiritual seeking. One Swami told a young man who had come to become a monk. He said, first become a gentleman, then you can become a monk. <laughs> what he meant was, a certain amount of cultivation, achievement in life. Another Swami, a tough old monk, whenever young people, young men would come to, I, I saw that happening, would come to become a monk, he would say, what do you want? Well, what have you come here for? I have come here to give up, renounce everything. Sannyasa means renouncing everything. And he would say, what have you got to renounce that you're going to renounce? The Buddha was a prince. He renounced the kingdom. What are you renouncing? <laughs> Very good. I am informed that food is ready. So that was a very useful session. Let us now go. Food for the soul and now food for the belly. Please join me downstairs. Thank you very much.